Good morning, everyone. Last week, Miles spoke to us about moments of turning. That as we go through our lives, there are certain moments that God breaks in and opens up a new door. Uh, He spoke to us from the life of Moses, that as Moses was going through the ordinary things of his day, he's suddenly looking after sheep, he just suddenly sees a burning bush. And as he turns towards it, not only his life is changed, but the entire course of salvation history is transformed. But I don't know if you found, when you've encountered one of those moments, that the moment an opportunity for turning happens, there's resistance. And part of the reason is that that when you want to turn, that involves a choice, and choices can be hard, choices can be costly. And the resistance, you'll find, not only comes externally, but also comes, strangely, internally. What I want us to look at today as we, as we go forward into this new year at the time when we kind of think about our lives afresh, or maybe for a few weeks anyway, and, um, and look at why this resistance comes and what God's solution to it is. I don't know if, um, if you spend much time thinking about your life and the direction you're going in. I, I tend to spend quite a lot of time thinking about it, not so much you, more about me. Uh, where have I come from? Where am I going? Was this a good idea? Uh, and then, then I'll, I'll sometimes think, well, I can't change the past, uh, so uh, I think about the future, and I think, you know, oh, uh, you know um, I, 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 I think, I'll ask God about it, and sometimes I get a really clear vision of where I'm going. But then I think, gosh, that's really far away, you know. Uh, it's kind of like there's that joke that people tell about rural people. And it's like you're, you're driving along and you stop to ask for directions. And you ask a farmer for directions. And the, dire- the, the farmer says, oh, if I were you going there, I wouldn't start from here. And, and I feel like that sometimes. I think, you know, if I was going there, if I uh, going towards this vision, I st- shouldn't start from here. I should have started 20 years ago, you know, when I was nine or something like that. And with all of that comes a lot of anxiety in decision-making. So in some areas of my life, I find it really easy to make decisions. And in other areas, I'm the king of the Facebook maybe. You know, the Facebook maybe. That's the mark of indecisiveness of our generation. It's been labeled FOMO, the fear of missing out. And when you have a fear of missing out, you end up not committing to anything, which means often that you try to do everything, which always results in disaster. And I know that it's not just me. There's been an article trending recently uh, called Why Generation Y is Unhappy. Generation Y is pretty much everyone who's grown up around the internet, either having it or as it was developed. And if, if that's not directly you, then that's definitely the people that you're uh, mentoring or nurturing or raising uh, or around and working with. And the subject of this article is why it is that Generation Y, statistically speaking, tends to be unhappy. And it's a really simple thesis. Their idea is that when your reality is better than your expectations, you're happy. But when your reality is worse than your expectations, you're unhappy. And the problem for Generation Y is that they've been given wildly unrealistic expectations. Uh, they've been raised, told, uh, told amazing things about themselves, but can sometimes leave a bit of a bitter aftertaste. We're, you know, we, we've been told, you can do anything. You can be president. I'm like, I could be president, but maybe that'd be settling. Maybe that's a bit beneath me. Or, or we've been told that, you know, we're special. Uh, and then when things don't go exactly our way, we struggle to understand why. You know, the heroes of this generation, tellingly, are people like Mark Zuckerberg, people who peak before the age of 22, and others. Now, being told these things can be really helpful. It's really important. As Miles said, you you won't drift into your destiny, but they can also crush us. As a pastor, often the the question you see people struggling with in their lives is, why is it I seem to excel in one area of my life, but not another? Or why is it I'm succeeding across the board, and I'm still not content. Now, as I said before, the, it is good to motivate ourselves. You know, we will not drift into our destiny. You cannot be uh, purposeless. Uh, you, ca- you cannot be passive in reaching your purpose. Jesus, even Jesus says, the kingdom of God advances forcefully, and forceful people take hold of it. There's a lot at stake. 
The decisions you make today determine who you will be in the future. No, nothing we do today is just killing time. The people we date, the jobs we do, uh, the investments we make in people, in our kids, in, in our grandkids, none of that is just killing time. Everything you do today is deciding who you'll be in the future. You reap what you sow, and you can't uh, sow onions and expect to reap pineapples. Meg Jay is a clinical psychologist who's been studying uh, uh, Generation Y, and she says, um, says statistically, what her research shows is that about 85% of life's most defining moments, of those aha moments, the, the most transforming decisions you make, happen before the age of 35. Now, that might not be you, but it is those people, again, who are around you, who you are mentoring, who you are raising. And she says that those people, uh, th those young people under the age of 35, they're like, she describes them like a plane taking off from KLIA heading east. A few degrees change in course is the difference between landing in uh, Alaska or L.A., so how is it, how is it we can stay wildly ambitious? How is it uh, that we can grab hold of God has prepared good works for us? It, he has called us. He came that we might have life in all its fullness. How can we have that without it crushing us? Because Jesus said, look, I, I didn't come to give you more burdens. Are you tired and weary? Come to me and you will have rest. Jesus, in other words, speaks into this predicament. A while back, there were two women who uh, spoke into my life. Uh, uh, they kind of mugged me with grace. And they, they, did it, they said exactly the same thing, completely independent of one another. Uh, they're both very similar. Uh, they're both uh, uh, older. They both have followed uh, Jesus for a long time. And they both at this stage had recently been widowed. And what they said to me was, always inquire of the Lord in whatever you do. Always inquire of the Lord in whatever you do. Or in the words of Jesus, seek first the kingdom of God. One of these ladies was my grandmother. Uh, we call her Nana Molly. And the reason it packed such a punch coming from her is what, it's because I've seen her live it out. I've seen it work for her. My, my grandmother grew up just after the war, and uh, one of the things she loved to do was listening to the wireless. That's the radio, not the Wi-Fi for the younger ones. And uh, her famous thing, uh, the, her favorite thing to do was listen to a radio show called Round the Horn. It was a comedy sketch show. And she loved it so much that she started writing her own little sketches for it, using the characters from the show. Uh, and she would share them with her friends. And one of her friends, Thelma, who she's still, who's still alive to this day, uh, um, said, oh, send them in. Uh, and so she, she sent them in to the show, not really thinking anything of it. Uh, and to her surprise, she got a reply. But even more surprising was that the reply was, thanks for your, your sketches, for your writings. We like them. Can we use them? Here's a check for the work you've already done. And would you like to carry on working with us? And so my grandmother uh, became a writer on this quite, quite popular radio show and, uh, and started writing uh, for quite a few months. Now, a few months down the line, they, they said to her, look, we'd love to meet you. It'd be good, you know, come meet the whole team. Why don't you come up, bring, bring a friend, and you can see the show being recorded, and then we can meet afterwards. And so uh, my nan and Molly uh, went up with her friend Thelma, who'd encouraged to send her in and to see the show being recorded. Now, the, the main guy in the show was a guy called Kenneth Horn. Now, he expected to meet a seasoned comedy writer. But what he actually met was my grandmother, who at the time was 14 years old. She, when she was supposed to be doing her homework, without her parents' knowledge, had been writing these sketches and con contributing to one of the biggest shows of her day. And uh, because they liked her work and they didn't care about child labor laws, they said, carry on. And so she carried on writing for them without her parents' knowledge for another four years until she was 18. Uh, at this point, she says that God spoke to her and called her into full-time ministry in the church. Uh, she had, all of our work is our vocation. Uh, but she said that God spoke clearly that she was to become a pastor. And, and so she started training, but with the full-time nature of her training and her work and, and also the, 
the show was slightly risque for its day. She promises me that none of her jokes were, but, um, and it was considered that she couldn't really do both jobs. So she had to choose. And she said she knew that God had called her to be a pastor. Uh, and so in that moment, she, she's, she had to give up something that she enjoyed doing. In seeking first God's kingdom, there was a cost. But you know what? I look at her now, uh, and she's 80 now, and uh, she's content. She's peaceful. She's happy. But one of her things she says to uh, all the grandkids is, I wouldn't do my life again, but I wouldn't change it for the world. She is content. And it's the thing that we see so often with Jesus. He's so happy. He, he has moments, he has periods of sadness, but there is contentment and there is peace in his life. He, he has a calling that was greater than any of our call, all of our callings put together. The burden on him was greater than anything we will ever have to carry, and yet he was at peace. And he shows us how to do it. He speaks to us and says, here's how to do it. Here's how to live with great calling, with great purpose. So taking those moments of turning uh, to full advantage. And here's how to do it without it crushing you. His key teaching on this comes in Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 25. Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 25. You might like to find it or follow it on the screens. It says this. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body and what you'll wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that even Solomon, in all of his splendor, was not dressed like one of these. If, God, if that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what should we eat, or what should we drink, or what should we wear? For the Gentiles, those who do not know God, in other words, they, that's what they run after, all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that, that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and the, all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now, the context of Jesus' words here, uh, this is part of what's called the Sermon on the Mount. If you're doing the Bible in one year, as Miles talked to us about, you'll have just finished reading the Sermon on the Mount two days ago, I think. And it's, the, um, it, it, it's kind of like Jesus' manifesto for what it is to follow him, what life in the kingdom of God is like and looks like. And this bit comes at the very end. And at surface level, it's really offensive. He says to them, don't worry. He, he's standing in the middle of a crowd that are religiously suppressed. They're ethnically suppressed. There is a big crowd. Some of them will die in the next few weeks. That They are a country that's occupied by a foreign military power. And he stands there and says, don't be anxious. It could be offensive. Or is it? See, Jesus doesn't say, don't worry about these things because they don't matter. They do matter. Psychologists will often talk about a, a hierarchy of needs. Uh, it's like a pyramid with, at the bottom you have like the basic needs like food, shelter, warmth, and at the top you, you, you need like satisfaction in your job and the love of a family and somewhere recently Wi-Fi became a big important rung in that ladder. And uh, and Jesus acknowledges these things. He says, you do need them. He says, your heavenly Father needs them. He doesn't say, don't worry, because food isn't important. If he had said that, the church in Malaysia would probably not exist. <laughs> food does matter. If you don't eat, you'll die. He doesn't say, don't worry about your clothes, because they don't matter. 
They do. If you go into work in a bikini, you'll get fired. Unless you're a lifeguard, maybe. I don't know. He finishes. He says, look, your heavenly father knows that you need them all. And he's not. This is the key thing. The surprising thing. He's not even just talking about the basic needs, you know, just sustenance and warmth. He's talking about the things that we desire that make us human. When he's talking about clothing, he doesn't just talk about the utility of, of covering and warmth. He talks about King Solomon in all of his splendor. He's talking about fashion, about the desire of humans to express themselves through their clothing. You know, the church has sometimes erred towards the kind of side of, you know, you should just eat dust and wear sackcloths. But we don't see that in the life of Jesus. He enjoyed celebrating more than most people, we're told. Uh, and even when he died, the clothing that he was wearing was considered, was considered nice. The soldiers didn't rip it up. They gambled to decide who would get this garment. But it wasn't what consumed him. See, Jesus doesn't say, don't worry about these things because they don't matter. He says, don't worry about them because they don't, it doesn't help. A while ago, I was driving with my family uh, um, uh, a a long journey and involved a boat transfer and some other things. And uh, and we were were driving off. And I, I, do you ever do this where you just faff? You just don't, you're not really doing anything. You're not doing nothing. You're just faffing around when you're supposed to be getting going. And, um, And I was just, just, mooching around the house, not really being like, this is urgent, we've got a big journey ahead of ourselves. And so by the time we got into the car, um, I suddenly realized that we had a three-hour journey to make, and we had exactly three hours to make it, including driving through KL. And, uh, and at that moment, I suddenly started to panic and started to worry. And I thought, gosh, we, we might not make it. Now, in that moment, as I panicked, worry did not make the car magically travel any faster. Worry did not separate the jam in any meaningful way. All worry did was make me a worse driver and worse company for everyone else who was in the car. Jesus doesn't say don't worry because it's not important. It is important. You know, this transfer was not on KL time. It was on the time and it was gone if you missed it. It is important. You know, he doesn't say don't ask questions about your life. Don't make a plan. Don't don't consider where you're going. He just says don't worry about it because it doesn't help. And in fact, it hinders. If you allow worry to be at the center of your life, when those moments of turning come, you'll be crippled and you won't be able to grab hold of them as he wants you to. But he doesn't just say, just stop it. Just don't do worry. He says, instead, replace it with something else. Replace it with seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness And he says, all these other things will be added to you as well. Jesus says, look, here's the deal. If you stop worrying about these things and instead seek first God's kingdom, if you make that the center of your life, everything else that you desire gets thrown in as well. But what does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God? And what even even is the kingdom of God? As I started to think about it, one of the things that struck me is, It's how strange it is that we have to seek God's kingdom. You know, every other kingdom, you do not need to seek it out if you are under its jurisdiction. We moved to here from the UK uh, about a year and a half ago. And when we left the United Kingdom, I did not have to seek out the United Kingdom tax department to find out how much money I owed them. They sought me out and told me how much money I had to give them. And when I arrived in Malaysia, in the kingdom of Malaysia, I did not have to seek out the tax department here. They sought me out to tell me how much money I needed to give them. Worldly kingdoms seek you. But God's kingdom we seek. Now, why is that? It's because as we see in, in the Sermon of the Mount, which is complete, shows, that, shows that the kingdom of God is an upside-down kingdom. We should know that because it's a strange kingdom where the king is crucified and the first citizen is a criminal. It's an upside-down kingdom. Other kingdoms enforce their rule on you. Jesus offers his rule to you. He says it's your choice. You can live in his kingdom or not. Now, he doesn't mince his words. He says, if you don't, you will miss out. You will miss out in this life and in eternity. But he doesn't force it on you. 
So what is it that he offers us? A kingdom is the rule and reign of a king or somebody who is in power. And the kingdom of God is the kingdom and influence of Jesus. It's the place where Jesus rules and reigns. But unlike other kingdoms, he doesn't start geographically or politically. He starts in the hearts and in the minds of his followers. He starts in us, in our hearts and minds. And then from the overflow of that works out geographically and politically for the transformation of society. And what that then means is that if you want to grow, if you want to grow as a Christian, if you want to grow in virtue, in godliness, in character, in joy, in goodness, you have to be active. As Miles said, you will not drift into your destiny. You you cannot be uh, 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 passive in your purpose. You have to seek God's kingdom. What does that mean? Well, simply, I think it means asking God, what is your agenda? God, what's your agenda? If I'm living under your rule and reign, what's your agenda for my 20 years or my 20-minute to-do list? It means when you go to the party, it means not worrying about will you be accepted or will you be liked, but asking God, what is it that you're doing here and how do I join in? And the amazing thing is God says, when you do that, all that other stuff that you worried you and consumed you, he'll give you that on top. My nana, and the reason I I keep bringing this up because I want you to know that it works, but my my grandmother worked as a minister with my grandfather for about 15 years. And then um, uh, after that time, my grandfather got really ill and was unable to work. And so they had to step down so she could care for him. But they also had three sons, uh, one which was my father, and they had to provide for him. And uh, so my grandmother, uh, looking for work, thought, well, I've not had any contact with the radio show, but I'll write to them, see if there's any chance of getting some work. So she wrote to them and said, you know, any chance you need another writer? And they wrote back immediately and said, yes, we'd love you to come and join. And it, it was a complete surprise. She hadn't heard from them in 15 years. But the amazing thing is that in that time, the show had gone from strength to strength to strength. Now is the most popular radio show on the BBC with a weekly audience of 15 million people. She gave up something that was significant but actually was quite small in comparison to what God gave her back to her after her obedience. Seek first the kingdom of God and he'll give you, you get the kingdom of God and you get everything else. So she was able to provide for her family during her illness during uh, my grandfather's illness. This is the principle of first things first. If you put first things first, you get second things thrown in as well. You know, we see this. You, know, you never enjoy food in its fullness when you're being greedy. You never enjoy sex in its fullness when you're being lusty. You never enjoy ownership when you're being selfish. You know, you, health, fitness, food, they are amazing things. But put that in the center of your life, and you become a bit strange. You know, keeping animals as pets is an amazing thing, but put a dog at the center of your life, or not only do you you lose your usefulness, you also lose the proper pleasure of keeping a dog. You know, you know, partying is amazing, but make drunkenness and uh, uh, the center and chief aim of every party, and you lose not only your dignity, but also the true goodness of enjoying alcohol as God intended it. This is the principle of first things first. Aim at heaven, and you get earth thrown in. Aim at the earth, and you get neither. It seems a strange rule, but we know it deep down, don't we? You know, if your house was on fire, your first priority would not be, hey, call the post office and redirect my mail. You know, we know that we see it at every level. Some of us were at the TEDx conference a while ago uh, here in KL and heard Idris Jala speak. And he, and he said that the first priority, whether you're dealing with small businesses or uh, big businesses, is to find out what your true north is. When you work out what true north is, everything else falls into its proper place. What is your true north? Jesus says, 
make it my kingdom. But the good news is he doesn't just stop there. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and my righteousness. And God's righteousness. This is the deal. We, we all look for something or someone or some practice that means that we can face the world and say, I'm okay. This is, this is what justifies us. This is what our righteousness is. You know, it's some person or practice or performance that means that we are okay. And the temptation is to earn it. In fact, every other religion, every world uh, view says you need to earn this. But if you earn it, you can lose it. Jesus comes to us and says, don't have a righteousness based on yourself. Hey, look, we don't even keep our own rules, let alone God's rules. He says, look, here's my gifted righteousness. An acceptability based on not what we do, but what Jesus has done for us on the cross. He says, seek first my righteousness. See, when, when I stop reading the Bible and get out of my kind of spiritual disciplines and habits, I stop, you know, worshipping or things like that, I revert to my small, mistaken view of God, that God is really far away and I need to try very hard. And when I fail, he'll forgive me because he knows I'm pathetic. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not very inviting, encouraging, or edifying. It's kind of like God saying, hey, run through this wall, run through this wall. I know you can't, and when you fail, I'll pick you up now, run again. And it's like, will I ever get through the wall? No. Uh, do I get a helmet? Do I get a cup? Do I get a day off? No. It's like, gosh, how am I supposed to live this life? That's not the picture of the God we see in Jesus. Yes, God's grace is there when you fail, but it's there before you fail to keep you strong so you don't have to. God's grace is there to transform you so that we become people who desire to seek after his kingdom. Yes, God's grace will pick you up when you fail, but it's there before to reorientate your life, to give you meaning and passion and value and purpose. And to give you, do you know what? Also, that gives you the security. It gives you the security in that moment to, to, grab hold of, to grab hold of what God is offering you in those moments of turning. You know, one of them, I, I know we're out of Christmas. I keep playing Christmas songs in the car, but it's gone. Uh, my, my favorite little detail in the Christmas story is, that, is, is the bit where Joseph has a moment of turning, and he actually makes the wrong decision. He, he finds out his uh, fiance is pregnant. He knows it's not him. He, he's upset. He's disgraced. And it, it says that he decides to divorce her quietly. But because he was a righteous man and didn't want to put her to shame, he was going to do it quietly. And I love that because in that moment, Joseph actually makes the wrong decision. But because he's a righteous man, because he's seeking after God's kingdom and after God's heart, he makes the wrong decision in the right way. And in that, God intervenes and puts him on the right course. This is the kind of security when we know that we are loved that frees us from worry, from fear, to grab hold of everything that God is calling us to. He gives us the power to seek first his kingdom, his presence within us. That means that this comes not as, an, as a something we strive really hard to do, but becomes primarily as an overflow of what he is doing within us. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of a God who loves you. He knows everything that you need. In the book of Romans, it says, look, look, God gave you his son. He gave you, he gave you the one thing he couldn't top. He's going to give you everything else. Everything else is, is nothing in comparison to what he's already given to us in his son. You know, he knows us. He knows what's best for us, even, even you know, when it seems hard. I, I think of um, uh, my, my grandmother's decision in that moment. It, must have been, it seemed really costly, but actually it wasn't. She lost nothing and got back more than she had in advance. And also, when, just after I was born, um, she had a stroke. And the way she describes the way it affected her was all the words just tumbled out of her head. Uh, she lost the ability to speak, and she had to learn from scratch how to put sentences together, how to form words, to do this thing that she'd you know, spent her whole life doing. But she hadn't spent her whole life doing it because God for a season had taken her out, had taken her on a new path on doing other things and then brought her back to it. 
You know, I've often thought if she hadn't been obedient in that moment, her whole life would just have been about words and how much harder that season would have been when she was learning to speak again. You know, as we seek first the kingdom of God, everything else gets added to us. So how do we do it? Jesus says, ask God what my agenda is for your life, for my life, for this meeting, for this day, and then submit to it. And that's the hard bit, isn't it? That's the hard bit, is submitting to it. Often we know what his will is for us, and we can say sorry, but it's the... How do you actually submit and do what he wants for you? And there's, to close, there's just two things I'd suggest uh, that I'd encourage you all to develop and have that help us submit to his agenda for our life. The first is you need a community of friends, Christian friends, who can walk this journey with you. Life is a journey. It's not a sprint. Uh, it's, it's hopefully many years of following him. And you need Christians around you that can help you so that when you're in the day where you're doubting uh, what God said to you, they can remind you what God said to you. You need Christians around you who you can say, hey, these are the things I really struggle with. Can you hold me accountable? When you see me going down this path, pull me back. But not just on the negative things. You know, if you're only accountable in the negative things, you might get through your life and never do anything bad, but you also might never do anything of value. You also have to be accountable in your purpose. You, you need to sit down with friends and work out, what is God's 70-year vision for your life? Hey, what's God's 700-year vision for your life? Because we don't just want to, you know, we don't just want to have a good time. We want to have a good legacy. And then have those friends hold you accountable to it. You need friends to walk this journey with you. But you also need a picture postcard of where it is you're going. This is why I shared uh, the story of my grandmother. She is a picture postcard of what it is to follow Jesus. She is somebody who is a lot further down the road to me. And when I'm struggling, when I'm thinking, is this really worth it? I can look at her life and go, yes, I can see that God has been faithful to her. And it doesn't just have to be people you know. It is good if it's people you know, but it can be Christians who've, who completed the race, read biographies, look at church history. But also, we are the most connected generation ever. You know, make it your business. Be nosy about what God is doing in the rest of the church around the world. Amazing things are going on around the world in the church today. At the same time, horrific things are going. This is the, uh, we're living in the age of the biggest persecution of the church ever. Most of it is happening in North Africa and the Middle East. And horrific things are happening. But in that as well, amazing things are happening. And God's light is shining in the darkness. Make it your business to find out about what is going on, of the stories uh, of what is going on in God's church in his kingdom on the earth today it will inspire you it will keep you going when you're trying to decide is this really worth the cost relevant magazine uh, ran uh, uh, the feature article just before christmas was called the new face of martyrdom whereas martyrdom was often considered in in christian circles of missionaries out in foreign fields now it is it's mostly people like you and me Normal Christians just in cities, as I said, in North Africa, in the Middle East, going about their lives who are being attacked for their faith. Uh, they shared two stories uh, of two people who'd been attacked for the faith. One was a guy called Magi, whose wife was killed and he lost the use of one of his arms. And he says this, before the attackers left Magi to die, they stole his cell phone, a common practice in such attacks. After receiving his initial care at the hospital, Magi borrowed a phone to call the attackers who'd taken his. He, 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 um, and they picked up. He told them, you people thought that you have killed me, but God has saved me. Surprisingly, he adds, that the attacker who answered the phone apologized. He said, I am a Christian. I don't bear judges, or grudges. I don't keep records of wrong, and I have already forgiven you. Another one who being asked about forgiveness said, it's, he says it's no problem. I've allowed God to handle everything. 
God is setting his agenda. He said, I forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. He said, if they had love, they wouldn't behave in this way. And the article finishes by saying, although the attackers stole so much from Sakaru, they couldn't take his joy, which is still evident on his face and in his voice. The joy comes from the Lord, he says, smiling. What is your agenda for your life? Jesus says to you today, seek his agenda for your life. Because his agenda is bigger, it's better, and it's bolder. Come, follow me, he says. Seek first my kingdom. Amen? Amen. Why don't we stand? We're going to pray, and then we're going to come and receive uh, in bread and wine what Jesus has done for us. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you want to meet with each and every one of us today. That you don't just give us a checklist, a to-do list, but that you give us yourself, your presence. Holy Spirit, prepare our hearts and minds now to receive you today. Come, Holy Spirit. Let's just wait on the Holy Spirit for a moment before we receive. Let's just wait.